Perfect. So thanks everyone for coming on. Uh, I'll just make sure now we're recording and I'll just get the uh, clock in the go. So we got about 25 minutes. So um, I was initially told 18, um, so it was, it was extended this evening. So I might have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. And if we don't get there, um, we'll come back. I'm sure there's a few minutes at the very end where people can uh, can ask in the, in the main group with, with the other uh, coaches as well. So um, we're working with the kind of nursery to under 12 group, and I suppose just my own background real quickly. I'm a GDA in Cork at the moment. <clears throat> I, I coordinate the Go Games, so from under 11 down, I coordinate the Games Programme um, in Cork, which is the biggest Games Programme in Ireland as regards the number of matches played, number of kids taking part. Um, I have a strong interest in the nursery. Uh, most of my coaching that I would do in primary schools would be with uh, the smaller classes from second class down, um, just again to re-emphasize on that, emphasize on that. And going through a lot of the stuff that, that Stuart mentioned while ago about the fundamentals and just the fundamental movements and trying to introduce that concept from the start. So um, so we'll get going there. And I suppose the first, the first question that I ask is, is why do girls join a camogie club? And I'm sure you can all think like you're probably a parent of a of a girl or you I'd imagine most of your parents or have been a parent of a child who started in a camogie club or a GA club. And usually the first thing is, is to, because their friends are playing. Um, and that's probably one of the most important parts, the social side of that. The second part is, is because of the fun that they would perceive to be involved with a, with a group and with a club. And probably one of the other most influential things would be the parents, that if your father or mother was involved in that club, you're more likely to be involved or they're more likely to encourage you to be involved. So from that perspective, I suppose, sorry, no, just moving. Um, you know, that, that, that's an introduction of why they start, but as they get into it and get playing, um, Stuart mentioned a lot of this stuff already, so I'll just go through it really quickly, but they, they want to be challenged. The fulfillment comes from executing activities and skills and being able to, able to progress and pr prove that, I suppose. Um, like anyone who's worked with, with a young group with five, six, sevens, we'll all know the first time a child hit the ball out of their hands, they're running over to you as the coach or the parent and telling you, I got it, I got it, you know? And they might have tried a hundred times before it to get that. And the, the enjoyment that they get of actually being able to do something is really important. So um, I suppose, can we provide a safe social space for them? So uh, can we put, put a, an environment in the club that they're able to come in, they're comfortable, they feel safe, they're amongst their, their, their peers, their classmates and stuff like that, but they, it's an enjoyable place. An enjoyable experience, it's fun. So like that, they're not running 20 laps, they're not doing press-ups or burpees for the night. Uh, they're doing stuff that they actually enjoy and stuff that, that's fun for them. So as a coach, that's a challenge for you to be able to put that into the sessions. Um, an adequate games program, so once they get, get up to kind of seven, eight, nine, they like playing matches. They like putting on the club jersey and playing against other clubs. Uh, no, we're not saying they have to do it every week, but they like doing it on a semi-regular semi basis. Um, and lastly, is can we ensure that they are adequately challenged to improve at the age appropriate level? So Stuart mentioned that already. Um, I, mean, I suppose I'll be a small bit contradicting what I'm talking about, but I, I think everyone will agree that we're kind of on the same wavelength as regards to the whole thing. So planning, not just the next session. What I'd say is you need to plan all the sessions. And what I mean by that is, is that there's, there's long-term planning, there's medium-term planning, there's short-term planning. And short-term planning is you driving in the car up to the pitch and thinking, what in the name of God are we going to do tonight? Um, we want to try to get out of that by giving you a few tips and a few tools that might help you to be able to kind of stave off that situation of arriving arriving up to the pitch and kind of going, well, what are we going to do tonight? You know, will we just do the same things we did last night? So one of the things that, that I'd be very conscious of, and uh, a scaffolding is, is a term used in coaching. Um, and for the, I think we all know what scaffolding is, layer on layer on layer. But I like to use the, the method of building a house, that you got to put in the foundations before you put in the ground floor, before you put in the first floor, before you put in the roof, before you put in everything into the house, the expensive stuff. Um, and the foundations a lot of time are the movements and stuff like that. But when you're looking at it, if we can actually start by going right, that's where we want to get to. How do we get there? And one of the simple simple met methods that I like to use, and it's something that actually came up um, about six or seven years ago, I would have seen on telly when Kilmurray Abricken from Clare were playing in the All-Ireland, I think it was a Munster final or All-Ireland semi-final of football. 
and they were talking to the random person in the club and they could have been coaching officer or it could have been the person that was probably driving the club for 50 years. But they said, what are you doing different? And what he said is we teach them three new skills every year and we get to where we are eventually. Uh, so I loved that sort of simple method of coaching. Um, and the thing is, with, with, with hurling and camogie and football, is you're never really doing a skill in isolation. So if I'm pucking the ball to a partner, even a ground strike to a partner over there, we're doing multiple skills. We're not just doing the puck um, or the ground strike. We're doing the person on the far side is probably stopping the moving ball. We're ensuring the correct grip is on the hurley. We might have to dribble to move the ball to a, a better position if it's too close to the body or something like that. That's so we're actually doing multiple that's skills that's with each thing. Um, so just oh. just with that, Maria, you might just uh, mute yourself there, if you don't mind. Um, so with that, these are just a simple meta, a simple program that I put um, together. And it's up to yourself. You know your group and what the standards are and stuff like that that might be able to advance a little bit quicker or maybe take it back a little bit. So what I what I say with this is that if you've got a five-year plan or a 10-year, six, seven-year plan, let's say up as far as under 12, what are we going to do? And if you can introduce three new skills every year, by the time they get to 10, they'll be after covering most of the skills. And then when you get to 11 and 12, you're just inputting those skills into game-based activities and challenging them in a different way than they might have been challenged when they were six and seven. So again, as I just said well ago, just because we're focusing on one skill doesn't mean we're not focusing, we're excluding every other skill. So I'll just go with even uh, under 10, the hand pass is the first associate skill there. And for the hand pass to work, to pass the ball to a partner, the partner has to catch the ball. So that's re reaffirming an exercise that we might have did at under nine, which is the catching, um, be it the low, the chest or the high, uh, whatever way we, we catch the ball. Um, if we're doing a ground strike or a strike from the hand, let's say at under nine, the core skill, what we're looking at is that we're probably the person on the other side will have to ball, will have to control the ball. They automatically stop moving ball or control the ball. Or for them to strike the strike from the hand, they might have to do the jab lift or the roll lift. So all the skills complement each other. But I suppose what we're doing is we're just setting a target. At the end of the year, we want to make sure we're really good at these three new skills. And if we can do that and ensure there's a gradual development year on year on year, it'll make it a lot easier for the kids. So now, as an under seven coach, you're driving up to the training session, you're going, right, the core skill is to strike on the run. And we can do the shoulder clash, ball control, which can be dribbling or flicking or stopping the moving ball, and the frontal block. And all of a sudden, in your head, it should get a lot easier to plan the session. Um, and I'll just go through a bit further what, what it might look like within a season. Um, but the last thing I'll, I'll say before I move on from this slide is the core skill is very, very important here. And the core skill, as you can see, is always strikers involved. So it's a ground strike, ground strike on the run, double weight and against the moving ball, strike from the hand, strike from the hand on the run. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only skill you work on in the year. But I'm saying by the end of the year, you want to be, you want all the girls to be somewhat competent at that. So you're going to put a fair emphasis on at under nine level on striking from the hand. Because you know you're after three years of striking on the ground here. Um, and you might at under eight, you might start doing the strike from the hand. But by the age of under nine, you want to make sure you can get all the girls up to that level where they're competent at striking from the hand. Um, so every single training session, what I'd say with uh, with striking is that it should be a minimum of 20, uh, 20 minutes, I'm saying 20 minutes out of an hour, but there should be a third of the training session should be committed to the striking because it really is the, the skill that if you go to a match or a blitz, the child that can puck the ball is not always the best player, but it's always the ball, always the person that can probably influence the game most. Um, so make sure every child is competent at those. So at the end of the under nine year, we want to make sure we're after spending a good time doing the frontal block down. We're after spending a good time doing the jab lift. We're after spending a good time doing catching, be it a high catch, chest catch, or a low catch, and a good time spent on striking from the hand. And if we can do that, and make sure every girl is competent, and move on to the next level, the next levels the next year, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, so at under 11 and under 12, as I said, it's just trying to go back. Maybe maybe we seen in the match last week that we were very poor on the, the bat down the high ball. So how do we work on that? We go back, we might have to work on that a little bit more. Um, but you should have most of the core skills covered by those first those first five years of involvement, okay? Um, 
So again, the last thing on that is that if a new coach comes in at under eight and your club have this kind of a structure and you're going to coach in the under eights for the first time and they're after the two, year, two years with the club, most of them, you know that they'll be semi-competent at most of the skills listed at the under six and under seven age. Um, in smaller clubs, and rural clubs where the ages are together, so they might be under, the under sevens might play with the under eights and the nines might play with the under tens. Again, it's just mixing a match in a small bit. How do we work these into the programme? So that's that's what I'd say is it looks like a long term plan as regards the skill coaching. Some of the movements that go with it are like the, you're talking lots and lots of chase games, multi directional movement, and your your warm up should really entail most of that. That you can get your chase games, um, your multi directional movement in as much as you can in the warm up, so that you you're not really committing too much time to it. At six and seven, you can put 50% of the session can be based on those activities. Because the kids, unlike back in our time where we were free to run around the schoolyard at break time and lunchtime, kids these days probably, in some a lot of the places don't have those luxuries, okay? So this though, it might be a little hard to see, but I'll just show you, I'll share a link where you can find this at the end, okay? So if I said we're with the under 10s, what might the season look like? And now this is a fairly extensive, um, page here but i'll break it down as quickly as i can so activity what are we doing as regards games what i mean by activity is like we're always going to train but what kind of games are going to play um i always remember from my own time as a youth and i don't know how often it happens notice but indoor hurling leagues um we used to love them you'd just go up there was no training you're put into three or four teams and you played match after match after match you might miss a game because there wasn't enough space there's other two teams playing but you just do something and what I always find is found was that nearly everybody came to those sessions because it was a match. And it wasn't a case of doing January and February, we're just going training. We're actually going to play in a match. Now, obviously, if this be from seven up, um, the fives and sixes wouldn't be wouldn't be at matches. Um, but from seven kind of eight up, you'd want to be thinking about what can we actually do to get the kids down? Can we play three on three or four on four activities? Um, not 10 on 10 or 12 on 12. Can we make it smaller and make it more more ball context, more touches and stuff like that? Uh, go game splits is throughout the year. I, I'm just basing this off a hurling program that if we were, if I was looking after the a team in Cork, this is the program that we put together is they'd play go games from March to June, um, which might be a match every, a blitz every second week at least in hurling or football. Um, so they might play six matches Six blitzes in hurling, six blitzes in football between March and June. Um, and I'll talk about ratios towards the end of this training to, to play. The summer league is something that uh, might not as much of an issue rural, but I know from my time in Dublin and my time in Cork now, there does seem to be a, a bit of a, a want to shut down during the summer. Um, that holidays and whatnot, that we're, we're not going to take in part. But if you've got 20 players, just 10 of them are probably still going to be around any given week in the summer. So is there a place where you can actually play a league? So maybe going training with six people might be difficult, but if you're playing a match or some sort of a competition, you might get 10 out and you might get everybody to round out to come. Um, September and October, we go back into the goal games, blitzes, and we finish off with the indoor leagues again. And you can see here the skills there, I'll break down real quickly again, is the core skill, striking. Strike from the hand under run for the first half of the year. Um, and then for the second half of the year, we're striking from the hand under pressure. So you can know your focus, your activity. So we're not just doing a trade, doing a drill where we're striking the ball down to the person on the far side, run to the back of the line. We're actually going to have to strike from the hand under pressure. How do we do that? What activities do we have to have in our back pocket that we go, these are what we're going to do for that. And in the associate skills, one, two, and the defensive skills. So with under 10 this day, I suppose one of the things to be very conscious of is as soon as we can teach a child how to swing, in, swing in a ball, on a ball on the ground and we're going to play matches, we have to be able to teach the defensive side of it as well to make sure that another child doesn't get hurt. We have to be able to, that if I'm swinging, what are you going to do if you're standing a metre away from me or a foot away from me? How are you able to defend yourself um, from that? And the hook, I've got the hook to block down tackling in there. And again, if you know for February, for our four training sessions, we got to work on the high catch each session, we got to work on the jab lift in each session, and we got to work on the hook in each session. It gets very, very easy for you as a coach to really, to one, focus on that skill and make sure you get de development over the four weeks, but two, to make sure that as a coach, we're actually putting adequate time to each skill needed. Um, so 
Is it a jab lift? Yeah. Every child at the age of 10 is probably able to jab lift the ball uncontested. But can they jab lift the ball when there's somebody chasing a meter behind them and they have to get from A to B as quick as they can? Um, do we put in, where do we put in the solo then as part of it? How do we use the solo? Are we just soloing from A to B and hand passing the ball? Are we soloing with pressure on? Yes, we can all do it. But remember about the house, we're after putting the foundation level now. Everybody can solo the ball uncontested. What's ground floor? Ground floor is probably the coach. Maybe standing in front of them, they have to run around the coach and solo. Stage, the first floor might be coaches chasing after them. And why I say the coach is that a lot of the time the coach, you will know if a strong person might need a little bit harder or you might be able to put a little bit more pressure on them. But a weak child might need you to lay off. Uh, whereas if you put the kids against each other and it just happens a good, a strong kid is with a weak kid, the strong kid will probably just get the ball off the weak kid straight away. So you have to be able to just modify that to suit um, as best as possible. I just went into physical there, continuation of evasion and chase games as before, lots of explosive movement, frog jumps, squat jumps, um, with more stuff. And in the types of sessions, the priority for under 10s is fun. The session should be mainly games based. And when I say that, I'll just go back one page, or no, I'll stay in this page. Um, if we're talking about striking from the hand under pressure, how can we put that into a game? And I'm thinking straight away, right, okay, can we do some version of no man's land where the person gets a ball on one side, and they have to run and strike the ball under pressure from somebody else. So again, this might be the coach. So we're not doing straight line drill. We're actually doing it in a game. I'm not, we're not doing it in a match yet, but we're doing it in a game, which should transfer to the game, to the match very quickly. Uh, it explains the session. Striking exercises, 10 to 15 minutes. Associate skills, five minutes each. Defensive skills, five minutes each. Matches and games should form a large part of the training session. Kids, a lot of time, just want to play the match. I always wonder why, do, why does we get more numbers on a Saturday morning to the Blitz than we do on a Friday night or a Thursday night for training? Because the kids want to play matches. Um, but on the counter side of it, you will have kids that like to go training and just happy to be in that environment where there's no pressure and stuff like that. Um, but is it? I'll, I'll share a link at the end where you can find that. Okay, I'll just keep going here. Over the course of the year, then, um, I suppose just get away from the training and matches thing is what else can you do differently to, to engage, you know? And I still think the, the old bus trip, now I know with COVID, we haven't done too many bus trips, but the bus trip away, be it to watch the county team playing above in whatever the main stadium is, or going to the all and final, stuff like that for the slightly older kids, they're massive days and they're days that'll stay with them forever. Like I remember the very first time I went on a bus to play a match and it was for Bandon under sevens against Corsi Rovers. And I could never remember who we played until I went down to Corsi Rovers pitches about five years ago when I started working back down in Cork. And I was like, this is where we played. So like that 30 years later, that still resonates with me, that bus trip when we got a bottle of Orangina after the match and it was three months out of date but these are the, just the things that will stick with them okay the next one is games and especially blitzes with multiple teams you'll find one-off matches are grand and there's nothing wrong with them and we put them into the schedule for under nines to under elevens but where possible is get three four five teams to a venue and play lots of smaller games so um if we have to go down to seven aside and play if we got two seven aside teams and we're playing three, four 15 minute games against four different teams, that's much more enjoyable for players than playing 15 on 15 from the start. So just be conscious of that. Try not to be accelerating their development uh, on what they do. Like on 37 now, we play a form, well, we call it social hurling every Thursday night and we basically play six a side. And it's lots and lots of ball contacts and, and we love it. But I had to go through the whole rigmarole of playing 15 aside for 30 years to get there. But it's really, really enjoyable. The more cut touches they get, the better. Another thing is when you are playing one-off matches, um, it's just one thing that I, I've seen at a match this year, an under-12 uh, football match, there was 27 players of one team, there was 24 with the other. They played a 13 on 13 match with one team at 14 subs and the other had, had 11 subs. And they're kind of going, lads, come on build another pitch, play 11 against 11, just get everybody on. So just be conscious of that. Give everybody as much game time as possible. Under 12 down, there's no cups to be won. There's no all earns. There's no coach of the year awards given out. Give everybody as much time as they come. If they come to the match, make sure they get adequate game time. 
that is the main reason people give up as they get older is the lack of game time. Um, I see it myself now. I'm not getting as much game time at junior B as I did three, four years ago. And I'm kind of going, do I want to be making this effort to come down every night and sit on the bench for 50 minutes or sit on the bench for a full match and not get any reward? So just think about things like that. Um, fun activities and training, like I love to, like we love trying to do something at the end of every training session. I do, I'm talking about an adult team I had last year, whether we do a crossbar challenge or we do a hit the post or we do a free taking competition or we do go out to, to the sideline and maybe try to score a point from an angle. Um, just simple things like that, just to leave on a bit of a high. And it's not just uh, finishing up with a war or cool down. They're actually doing something that just gives them a little kick at the end of it. Um, the lads always loved it. I say, no matter who would do it, would love it. But you can change it up. Like think of, of different things, um, such as like even a, we did one night, we did a rock, paper, scissors, snake, where we the old fellas against the young fellas, a rock, paper, scissors. If you won, you stayed on. If you lost, you were eliminated until it was down to the last person and that team won. And just it just got a bit of a buzz going and they liked it. Um, Guest trainers from adult teams as well is really, really important. Uh, I can remember nearly every time one of the killer senior hurlers came down and coached us underage. It's just something different. No slight against you as a coach and no slight against my father and the coaches we had. It's just different. We just look at those people different. They're probably a worse coach, but it's just that, they're, well, I'm not saying they're a worse coach, but it's just a different voice. And it just builds that link between the juvenile and the adult. It's one thing I see in clubs these days is that clubs are very much the difference. Um, back in my time, I'd always say that I knew every adult player in our club, but now I wouldn't know nearly any juvenile. And I'd say very few juveniles know me. So try to build that connection through the training sessions, which will transfer to on a match day when the senior team or the junior camogie team are playing a match. We're going to play a match at half time uh, against the opposition. Small, might only be a 10 minute game, but we're going to do it to just get parents down supporting the club and about the whole club set of factors. Um, lastly, here, my information, all the information I put up there, so the slides on that and that are available at gamecoaching.com. Uh, go into the blog section, you'll find it. Plan long term first, then plan medium term, and finally, the short term planning becomes very easy. So, as I, as I said, if you've got that and that, or a version of it similar to what a catering for whatever your club needs or your group needs, it's very easy then to come up with what are you going to do on the training session. So in June, we're striking from the hand under pressure is going to be the main part of the session. We're going to bat in a high ball. So how can we add that into the game? Right, we put that as part of no man's land where it actually hitting the ball over. The other side must bat it down for a point. Um, or else we can do it that the other crowd, the other team must, you have to strike the ball low and hard through a goals and the other team on the far side are doing ball control. Um, or we can add to it that they're doing a block down as part of it. So game base is the best possible. Um, I know we're almost out of time, but if anyone has any any questions, um, feel free to just throw your throw your hand up there, and we'll try to uh, we'll try to try to answer whatever questions. If there's nothing, in, or if you want to put something into the chat, um, sorry, I know we went on a bit longer than I, I expected, but as I said, just spend a small little bit of time planning. It actually it, it will make life very very easy, uh, Susan. Yeah, Susan. Second Just a quick question, please. Yeah. Um, we do both camogie and football as one team. Yeah. Um, we're only new to the camogie in our area when it actually started under six, under eight um, last year. Do you know for the under sixes, because they only do one session per week, how yeah. would you advise div dividing up the sessions? Should we just do all camogie one week, football the other, or is half and half a I... way to go? I would, what I'd actually say, Susan, right, I'd actually do 40 minutes of one and 20 minutes of the other. But, and this is only my own thought, now somebody else might give better advice on this, is what I'm thinking, let's say you do football this week as the main body of the session. So we want to make sure we do get a proper bit of coaching and development into them rather than just squeezing it through and 25 minutes later we're gone. Um, have a think about then the last 20 minutes or the last 15 minutes is just a camogie match. It's not, we're not doing any training. We're just playing a match, just putting a hurley into the hand, getting them playing because um, uh, you'd also see it, like you probably see it yourself, some girls want to play football, some, some won't yeah. play camogie. And, yeah. But if it's a match, they'll probably go, ah, sure, I'll stay and do it. So, um, But by, by putting the two of them on the same day, it'll kind of just try to marry that, that the ones who would all want to play one might actually just stay around and play it. So I suggest something like that. If anyone else has any better suggestion on something they did themselves, feel free to throw it into the chat. 
but I, I just know that if you go two weeks without playing the Camogie and vice versa, if you go two weeks without playing the football, you could yeah. see the skills might just fall down a small bit and you're kind of restarting all the time. No, but that if you makes can sense. Just get it in. So I'd say something like that, but as I said, leave it be the match for 15 minutes at the end of it. So we're going to do 40 minutes of football training. The match today is going to be a Camogie match and vice versa. We're going to do 40 minutes of Camogie training and we're going to play in a match at the end of it. It's going to be football. Yeah, um, good idea. So yeah, perfect. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. So I'd say we leave it at that because the room is going to close in 28 seconds. Um, so thanks very much for your time. As I said, the, my details are there, Game Coaching, G-A-A-M-E Coaching. That'll get you to the blog and you can contact me on Twitter there or anything and uh, I'll help out as best I can and sharing some information, okay? So uh, thanks everybody.